Well, hi, welcome to the podcast. My guest is Samantha Riley. She's joining us from um, England. We're going to learn about her and her background and what she does. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, process behavior charts or whatever terminology that we would want um, to use. Um, Sam is the Deputy Director of Intensive Support for NHS England and Improvement, the National Health Service over there, of course. So Sam, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really, I'm, I'm so excited that we can do this. How are Me you? Me too. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. We've, um, this might not sound like the most gracious thing to say as a host, but like I've wanted to do this for a couple of years and we, we've talked about it and I'm, I'm just really excited that schedules um, finally lined up and that, that we're doing this and having this discussion today. Yeah, and we're, we're Twitter buddies, aren't we? That's how we've connected. <laughs> yes, I've uh, been a big fan of, of what you and your colleagues share on Twitter. And I've, um, you know, hopefully without hijacking it, I try to promote and share a hashtag that I think we're aligned on. Hashtag plot the dots. That's it. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, and I encourage people um, to go and, and check that out and see um, what Sam shares there. Um, so, you know, first off, I'm, I'm curious your your title, um, Deputy Director of Intensive Support. Could you tell us yeah. what that role entails, what that means? Okay, so um, just to start by saying I've got a really small team and we are focused on supporting those organisations in England that have got the most challenges. So those might be quality challenges, or they might be financial challenges, or they might be both types of challenges. And we provide specific support, um, focusing on how they can use their data and get more out of it to make better decisions. So we provide a very intensive package of support to those organisations, but we also provide support to any organisation pretty much in the NHS in England that wants to work with us. Um, so we've got a kind of two-stage support programme. So intensive support is not to be concern, uh, confused with intensive care? No, 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 no. So this is intensive support to help those organisations really improve, probably in a whole range of areas, but it won't be a surprise to you, Mark, to, um, to realise that, of course, data is a common theme where we see challenged organisations, they're probably not making the use of their data in the best way. And I love how you frame that, and we're, we'll have a chance to explore this here of making better decisions with data. Um, but I'm, I'm I'm curious, you know, with um, as varied as the NHS can be throughout the country and different parts of the NHS and the different um, hospitals and trusts, um, are are there some that if if we were to make a parallel between organizational health? and individual health? Are, are there some organizations, do they tend to reach out because they are in need of some intensive care at an organizational level that they have um, more need for improvement? Mm. So some organizations would, um, but in England, we would have regulatory organizations, including the one that I work for, that would, um, I suppose, badge an organization as requiring support they're probably failing a range of targets. We have lots of targets in England. I'm sure you probably do as well. So it's probably organisations that are not performing well, well against the whole range of targets and they're not doing very well in terms of their um, kind of financial position. But yes, we get approached by people that just realise that actually maybe we're not in that challenge position in terms of um, failing lots of targets, but we kind of know that we could be doing better in terms of how we use our data. Yeah. And so your background, when, when we talk about metrics and data and statistics and statistical process control, it, are, are you a statistician or what, what is your professional background? So I'm not a statistician. I'm revealing all now. I'm not a statistician. I'm not even an analyst. So I've got nearly 25 years experience in the health service. And I've done a whole range of different management roles. And I think I've always had an interest in data. So I've always wanted to improve things. You can't improve anything unless you've got good data. So I've done a range of roles um, focused on improvement, but increasingly over the years, focusing on the power of data. So I was probably introduced to statistical process control about 20 years ago, when we first looked at applying SPC to um, health service data. And it kind of had quite a good impact 
20 years ago and then people kind of stopped doing it I'm not quite sure why maybe it wasn't flavor of the month anymore maybe people forgot about it mm -hmm. they've been on a kind of personal mission for the last 20 years really to make sure that we do make good use of this approach which has got such massive benefit yes and we'll have a chance to explore all of that um, here. But, um, you know, just to step back and say, I think it's certainly it's quite all right that you're not a statistician. I, I don't think I would um, I, I've not earned that label. But, you know, I think our work in both, you know, is uh, influenced on both sides of the pond here by a statistician, Don Wheeler. And, and I think Dr. Wheeler is is unique in that. He, he takes what could seem like um, complicated or arcane methods, and he's really very focused on the practical, the use of data, um, not just um, running the numbers in different ways, but making sure it's of practical use connected to improvement work. So I think while we, we're, we're fortunate to learn from a statistician, we don't have to be statisticians to, um, to put these methods to use or to, to teach and coach others. What, what, what do you say? Yeah. Um, that absolutely. And I think sometimes maybe there's a benefit, but I'm not a statistician because I do have to translate things for myself mm -hmm. into kind of plain English so that I can tell other people. And we've very much been inspired by um, Donald Wheeler. So I know that there are lots of people that are well are kind of written, written lots of books on SPC, but it's Donald Wheeler that really appeals to us because of that kind of practical application. So you're already, I know, familiar with the resources that we've developed a few years ago called Making Data Count. Of course, I have a little copy of the hard copy little yes, booklet yes. here. But that's very much been inspired by um, Donald Wheeler's approach. So we've taken the approach of teaching SPC in probably a more simplistic form than some other people would have done. And that's really paid off, off for us. It's really paid yeah, dividends. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and that book there, and it is available. You know, the it's still available as a free PDF online, and and yeah, making data counts. Yeah, we've got two interactive PDFs that are quite lengthy, um, so they're quite nice if people want to go and have a look at them. We've got the little mini guide, just because when we do teaching, quite nice to um, give people something that they can kind of keep in their handbag, not quite their back pocket, but that kind of thing. Yeah. And particularly when we're working lots of boards, working with lots of boards, very senior people, it's nice to be able to provide them with a reference guide of the, the key things that they need to remember. Yeah, and and you're right. It's it's a it's a very rich interactive PDF with embedded videos, and it's it's a really uh, impressive product. Um, so something that can be helpful and beneficial to people outside of NHS England, I think for sure. Absolutely. It was a bit of a life's work to get both of those published, but it's absolutely, um, again, paid dividends. And we very much wrote those PDFs with people in mind that weren't really technical people. So people that were coming to this afresh. And we've tried to make this topic exciting as well. We've talked before about, you know, sometimes people can think that data can be a bit dry. Well, it really doesn't need to be. So we've really focused on trying to make it as exciting for people as possible and relevant and really showing what right. a different good use of data can make. Yes, for sure. And uh, plain language and, you know, relatively simple math is um, really helpful and powerful. I mean, you use the word simplistic and some people might say, well, simplistic sounds bad, but I think, no, it's, it's, it's valid, it's relevant, it's approachable. It's, I, I think once people learn these methods, whether we call it SPC or control charts or process behavior charts, it's not really that difficult to learn. And people might be scared off um, by what they think statistics would entail if they're thinking of more theoretical textbook physics, um, not physics, sorry, theoretical textbook statistics that they might have been taught in college, perhaps. Absolutely. So I think by keeping it really simple, we've been able to engage with a really wide range of audiences. And actually, we don't change our teaching dependent on whether we're talking to a board or, let's say, a, a group of uh, maybe ward staff that are looking to do an improvement project. And, and that's, that's great, isn't it, that we can engage such a wide audience with a topic that doesn't need to be complicated, but mm -hmm. could make a massive difference to people's everyday working lives. And for us, of course, the benefits are the benefits of patients. 
Right. Yes. And, and we'll um, we'll hear more about that. And, um, you know, I think, um, yeah, this is it's a powerful method that most people just haven't been exposed to. And, and that's why I appreciate what you've been doing to help um, spread and, and promote these methods. I've, I've tried doing the same um, in different ways. It, it, you know, think, well, why do people not use these methods? Well, they probably haven't been exposed to them. And, and so before we talk about the methods, you know, maybe structure this, uh, the, the discussion a little bit as um, a verbal A3, if, if you will. Like we have the challenge here of talking about um, these process behavior charts, a very visual method. Here we are just talking about it in what's primarily an audio format. So we'll, 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 we'll do in a kind of audio A3. You know, before talking about this solution of these charts, maybe we talk about where you start the conversation with boards or with hospital leaders. Um, what, what are some of the problem statements related to, like, for example, you know, here um, we, we quite frequently see uh, red and green color-coded numbers. You, you talk about RAG uh, or yeah. RAG. Um, can, can you sort of introduce, like, what's some of the current state of how leaders look at metrics over time? Yes, so um, in the NHS, people have been wedded to, I suppose, a couple of visualizations of data that we see a huge amount. So yes, we also see huge numbers of rag rated charts. So charts that are rated as green, you're passing the target. Um, red, you're failing the target. Then amber's kind of somewhere in between. I'm not sometimes sure how people come up with their <laughs> amber, but they do manage to do that. And so pretty much all of the performance reporting that you would see if you went online and you looked at a um, hospital website, all of these documents are public. You would see lots of rag tables coloured in the way that we've described. We also quite commonly see lots of arrows. So the arrow that goes up, so the number went up this month, the number <laughs> went down this month. And actually in England, many years ago, we used to have a game show called Playing Your Cards Right, and it was hosted by somebody called Bruce Forsyth. And that was basically the game. It was the card. Is it going to be higher or lower hmm. or the same? But that's fundamentally how we've been um, making decisions in the health service at board level on the basis of all of the data that we've got related to performance. So that's the standard stuff that we see. We also try and um, wipe out any badly presented data. So we've... Um, We've got various names for different types of visuals. So we quite often see spaghetti charts. So those are charts when you've got different colored lines for different years of performance. I don't know how often you see those. Or maybe it's different um, wards or units within a hospital. So basically a fuzz of different lines of different colors so you can't see a nurse what's going on. Mm -hmm. You quite often see lots of stacked bar charts as well. Um, so we've got a few rainbows of confusion, we like to call those, because they're generally <laughs> quite colourful. Yeah. Um, but that's the kind of world that we're entering into when we go and speak to a board. So lots of horribly presented data. We do sometimes see statistical process control charts, um, but we'll talk maybe in, in, in a little bit about what we've done to enhance people's ability to really use the SPC charts to drive improvement because I think we've, we've got a couple of tricks up our sleeve which we haven't seen used before. Yeah well and the, to me there are a couple of different sub problems. One is as you put it the horribly presented data the charts that are just visually messy hard to make sense of. What I heard you describing um, it's funny I, to me a spaghetti chart we use that when we draw out and trace where people are walking in a okay. unit or across departments but when you have those lines yeah i i think it looks the same thing so what you're describing would be let's say the x-axis just goes january to december and you have three or four or five years different lines all just overlaid instead of being one continuous time series is that what you're That's it. describing yeah absolutely yeah. uh-huh yeah not helpful yeah, I mean, if, if anything, maybe it helps you see seasonality, but it can be really misleading trying to compare over time. Absolutely. You could just lay the lines alongside each other, of course. Right. 
Right. That's that's <laughs> that's my preference. And um, yeah. So well, hashtag plot the dots that way. A time yeah, series exactly. instead of overlaying these charts. So I agree. There there are different yeah horrible ways of presenting the data, and then there's um, the bad decisions that perhaps get made from. Um, let's say a metric has suddenly shifted from green to red. Um, what what would be an example where that might be a bad reaction? Or, or you say, well, oh, well, now it's bad. Oh, yeah. So we see lots of major reactions um, at every level, actually, in the NHS that's using this form of reporting, where there's going to be a big panic. Because suddenly somebody's gone into the red, somebody's going to be sent off, to investigate what suddenly happened. And then, of course, there'll be lots of time, energy, effort, resource investigating something when that could, of course, just have occurred randomly. That could be a random change in the data. And we do have a special term for that, but um, I'll talk to you about that a bit later, maybe. We've got a term for overreacting to a data point. Well, so that was, well, yeah, so let's 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 come to that here in a second. But I was, I was also going to go back. Um, and add uh, that game show that you described in the United mm -hmm. States that was called Card Sharks. And I used to watch that um, as a child. And in fact, there was a re, um, they call it a reboot, like ABC television network here in the US. They run out of ideas, so they bring back old game shows yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a slightly more modern um, wrapper. So yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, you, you, you have that up, down, pattern and I, I i don't have the math right in front of me but if you look at a deck of cards where the face cards are all tens and like the, the average number in that deck is probably about 7.5 i don't know you know because there's more face cards but to your point like the fact that you get a nine out of that deck followed by a six doesn't mean the system has changed. It's the same deck of cards and the same thing would apply to metrics being an out, output of a, a work system, right? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, when we go into the green, maybe there's gonna be people patting themselves on the back <laughs> because something something happened since last month that's turned them into the green. So um, then there could of course be some congratulations. What we did worked, whereas, well, Maybe they did do something, but in our experience, we're quite often seeing the situation where we're seeing what we would call a flip-flop between red and green. So maybe mm -hmm. we might see green, 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 red, green, green, red, red, red. And that's probably happening randomly rather than actually that being caused by something that, that was actually put in place perfectly. Yeah, and, and this happens, I've seen a lot where the target is set to be just a little bit better than last year's average. That's a recipe for fluctuating uh, between red and green. Yeah. I mean, in the NHS, we mainly have our targets set for us. So we might have organizations setting kind of internal targets. But in the main, in the health service in England, um, people would be very interested in how they're performing against the targets against which they judge. And that, that term, there is that word. So like when I had the opportunity to work um, in, in England um, with an NHS hospital going back in like 2008, as, as we learned and we had fun with it, but sometimes it got in the way. We talk about two countries separated by a common language. Okay. And uh, there, there's that one term, which I think is the one you're going to bring up where I'm like, oh, I don't know that word. We don't use it here, but it sounds great. That word that talks about this overreaction is. Yes. OK. Shall I reveal the word? So the word is spuddling. 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 So it's only a few years ago that I came across it. And actually, I came across it due to another quiz show. So the, the word spuddling is an old English word, so it's several hundred years old. And the definition is to make a lot of fuss about trivial things as if they were important. <laughs> and that has really chimed with the boards that we've worked with. And actually, every team of people that we've worked with, when we, when we mention the word spuddling, and we'll have done some interactive exercises with people and we've kind of we will have tricked them into overreacting to some normal data. And then we have these cards that I think you might have seen on Twitter, Mark, 
people have asked us for cards that they can raise in a meeting that ask their colleague, are you spuddling? So we've got a yellow card, <laughs> which is a kind of first warning. So like football. It sounds like yeah. a silly yeah. thing, like football, yeah. It sounds like a silly thing. But you might have the yellow card raised against you if somebody thinks you're <laughs> overreacting to a data point. And then we also have red cards that might be raised if you do it again. So it's genuinely starting to drive some real behaviour change because it's enabling people to challenge their colleagues in a kind of fun and quite subtle way. But actually, of course, it's a really important challenge. Yeah, and when we talk about exercises, do you use the, the, the red bead game as one of those or do you have your own exercises that help trigger that overreaction to noise in the metric, if you will? Yes, yeah, so we don't use that game. We have developed our own suite of games. So um, just to say, if anybody ever wants to join any training, they can jump onto our free training. Well, they, they will be introduced to a, a couple called John and Mary. We take people through the story of John and Mary. I'm not going to reveal the story of them. It just wouldn't be right. But um, people probably change their mind about John as we go through this scenario. Um, so they might quite like him in the start and not like him at the end. Yeah. Um, and we also use another game where we um, basically simulate a real set of data and we pretend that it's in a healthcare setting. So maybe we pretend that it relates to the number of patients falling in a hospital every month. Mm -hmm. And we ask people about whether I'm doing a good job as the programme director to reduce the number of falls. And they're quite good ways to get people to engage with a data set. Um, and just test out how they're going to react to it. We kind of almost trick them into reacting how they would do if they were receiving a board report. Mm -hmm. And then we reveal some things about what the data was. And I think some of those things, I'm not a psychology expert at all, but I've heard from some other people that know a bit more about it, that it's that kind of shock factor mm -hmm. that really stays with people, that they realise that, oh, I was kind of tricked there. Yeah. But that learning, that experiential learning um, is, is really powerful. And um, if, if you can get people to um, be curious about that opportunity, um, you know, these, these methods are very teachable. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how, how do you bring boards and other leaders to the table or to the classroom or to the virtual Microsoft Teams training? Like, how do you... How do you pique their interest? Because I, th I, th I think leaders, when they're used to managing a certain way with knee-jerk reactions, certain visualizations, red and green, they don't like to be told, well, you're, you're managing badly. So I'm sure you must have a better way of, of bringing up this whole conversation. How do you invite people and how do you get them to accept your invitation to come and learn? Yeah, so it's a tricky path. Um, so to start with, when we first started the board training, we asked really for some guinea pig people to put up their hands and to say that they would like to participate in a board session. So they were probably the boards that already thought that they could do better with their data. And actually, we learned a lot from those early board sessions. We learned about what didn't work. We learned that the sessions were too long. We learned that we taught them some things that whilst they were kind of interesting, they didn't actually make a massive impact in terms of changing their behavior. So we, we, for instance, used to teach them about Pareto charts and run charts. And we just don't do that anymore because it was yeah. SPC that was the real difference. Um, so initially it was getting some guinea pigs. And after then, this might sound ridiculous, but we've never had to really market these sessions. So I might have put out a little message, for instance, on Twitter and said, oh, you know, who wants a board session on how to use their data? We've now done so many boards that it's word of mouth. So if I just put it into context, so in England, we've got 217 trusts. So we do have clinical commissioning groups, and now we're working towards whole system working. But we've got 217 trusts. We've now run, I think we're just coming up to our 130th board session. And some of those have been with commissioning bodies, but most of them have been with trusts. And now it literally is word of mouth. So people enjoy the sessions so much. They are interactive sessions. They're fun sessions. As I said, we play little games with them. Mm -hmm. People really enjoy the sessions. So now 
people are telling their colleagues in the neighbouring trust, actually, you should get Sam's team into on one of these sessions. So we're really pleased with that impact over the space of three years. With a very small team, you know, at times it's been a team of two. Now we're up to a team of four, but that's not bad going. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's it's great progress. Um, and, and these board sessions have more often than not led to changes in their approach. They're not just having fun. They're, they're putting this into practice. If you could share yes. more about that. So they are. So to start by saying we haven't yet had a board tell us that they're not going to change. And you're right, Mark, when you say it is difficult to go into an organization, really what we're saying to them is the way that you've been using your data probably for years has led to poor decision making. That is a difficult message to land. Right. Now, when we run board sessions, I would say that 80% of the content is exactly the same. But the critical content is the stuff that we tailor to the own, their own organisation. So we'll prepare for every board session. We'll go through the public documents. So in England, all of the trusts would have publicly available performance reports. We'll have a look at how they look. And then we'll basically rerun the data as statistical process control charts. And we're looking for a mixture of examples there where we find improvement that they haven't known about, we find deterioration they might not have known about. And then there's probably a whole lot of stuff when they're flip-flopping between that red and green, which is, of course, when they might be spuddling. And we'll replay those examples in the board session, but in quite a gentle way. So we'll never go in and we will never say, your data presentation is awful. But by now, we'll have shown them lots of examples that aren't theirs, that are awful. They'll kind of know themselves that actually, mm -hmm. you know, we could be doing a lot better here. So, um, but it can be difficult, but we're always trying to build on what they've done. Mm -hmm. So everybody mm -hmm. has said that they are going to change. But of course, the key question is, have they changed? Right. And the answer is um, a very significant proportion of them have changed. Not all of them. Of course, there are other factors at play sometimes here. Is there the real will to make this happen? Are there technical challenges? You know, there's a whole range of stuff that could be in the mix there. But um, we know from independent research that there's been a significant increase in the number of SBC charts within the past few years as a result of the training, which is exciting. And I would say that I would now probably have, I reckon, about between 25 and 30 organisations where I consider their reporting for their integrated performance report to be exemplary. Hmm. And some of this is touched on in an article that was just recently published. I'll, I'll put a link to this in the show notes because people um, can go and read it. It's an article called National Health Service Trust Boards Adopt Statistical Process Control Reporting, the Impact of the Making Data Count Training Program. Yes, I was very pleased with that. That was um, yeah. quite a mission to get that published. But that's a paper that describes what we've learned from working with boards. So a bit more about what we've done and what we've learned. We've got quite a lot of evidence in there from some independent evaluation interviews with board members talking about the impact of the training. We've also got some quantitative data in there related to the increase in the number of charts. Yeah. And, you know, it's... You know, it's it's one thing to create the charts, but then there's a, to your question of have they really changed? I mean, I'm, you know, uh, empathetic, you know, the people, um, you know, because it is hard. It's difficult to change habits. And by the time you're working with board members or executives, they may have 25 or 30 or 35 years of these old habits. And that's difficult. Um as you know, you talk about, um, and I'm learning, okay, it's three syllables, um, spuddling. Spuddling, yeah. <laughs> I, I tried to make it two syllables, spuddling, but spuddling. Um, that spuddling leads to poor cause and effect relationships. Like, so when you have that, that, uh, that flip-flop, up-down um, dynamic, I've, I've heard people from health systems here in the U.S. describe the dynamic as pizza or panic. Because yes. when the number gets better, they throw a pizza party. And then when the number gets worse, they panic. Um, and, 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 and I think you were touching on this earlier. When, let's say, the number is bad, managers get upset, 
they ask for explanations or root cause analysis or action. And then people kind of look around and say, well, I don't know what we could really come up with. Um, you yeah. know, Don Wheeler <laughs> describes this as writing fiction. Don't pressure people to go write fiction about why that number got worse. And in the meantime, the number then may flip flop in a positive direction. And the leader thinks, oh, the performance got better because I inspired them or I pressured them <laughs> or I got upset with them when really no such thing is happening. It's it's just this, this spuddling effect. Yeah. And what we know for definite is that the um, what we're hearing is the biggest impact from all of these board sessions and the change in style of reporting. The biggest impact is a reduction in spuddling activity, which can only be a good thing because, of course, you know, if we're, we're thinking about the impact of board conversations and decisions, that's going to cascade down to an organisation where more and more people are going to be sent off to investigate or explain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're aiming not just for the board to change their reporting style. We do want that to go down through the organisation. And we've got lots of examples of that starting to happen. But I think just by the board changing their own behaviour, that is, you know, providing some positive consequence for other people within the organisation. Yeah. Do you have any data around time saved? Because I, I share this hypothesis that there is so much wasted time up and down an organization um, chasing the noise or the common cause variation or the, the, the random fluctuation. That time, that wasted time could be put, put to better use for, yeah. for real improvement. Um, you know, uh, I'm, 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 do, you, do you have, have you been able, because it seems like it would be really difficult to measure. Do you have any data or even just a sense of it? So we've got a good sense that people are spending less time doing that, but sadly yeah. no hard data, which is a shame. It would be great to have, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. But um, it sounds like, yeah, topic for a good another research paper, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You, you can have people track uh, how many yellow cards are they holding up in meetings and see if that declines. But we'd have to be careful. Maybe people just get tired of holding up the card. We, hopefully the real. <laughs> exactly. We don't hopefully. want to encourage bad behavior, do we? Right, right. Um, and, that, and you know, this is a, you know, kind of a different topic, but related to using data. I mean, there, there, there is a risk if we have a target. Let's say if somebody said, well, my target is no more than two yellow cards per week, people might just stop putting up the cards or you have a distortion of the system. Um, is, is, what, what are some of your experiences or, or thoughts there? Can this approach with the making data count um, book and training and program, does it help people have a better sense of improving in real ways. Like I'm thinking of what Brian Joyner taught. When you have a target and there's pressure to meet the target, people can actually improve the system or they distort the system or they distort the data. Do you, do you focus on, on that or is that sort of a separate issue? Um, well, undoubtedly, sometimes those targets do, of course, encourage some kinds of behaviors that we wouldn't want to see. So we don't get deep into that topic when we are um, working with boards, but we would also always want to talk about having a balanced set of measures. Mm -hmm. So we do have the targets. We can't get away from the targets. Those are what we've got. But let's start to look at what we can look at in combination to start to understand what's really going on here. And I think we've got some good examples when we've been able to start working with clinical teams that are maybe working in an accident and emergency department. Um, and they've started to use their own data. Maybe they're collecting on a daily basis. They might not really be using it properly on a daily basis. When they can start to see that actually the improvement projects they have got in place are having the desired impact or aren't having the desired impact, then my experience is that's really encouraging for them to be able to actually see what is the impact of what we're doing rather than just kind of guessing, which right. is sadly what lots of people have been doing for years. You know, we do, we implement the improvement plan and we assume the change that we wanted to happen happened. And we'd, we'd love mm -hmm. that to be the case, wouldn't we? But um, sometimes yeah. that isn't the case. So for mm -hmm. people to actually be able to see that, 
that, of course, is over time going to improve that performance, isn't it? And hopefully get to the point where we can achieve that target. Yes. Um, so when we have a situation, I'm, I'm curious what language you use in talking with people. Um, you know, so let's say we have a situation where the number is just flip flopping week to week, month to month. Uh, it's just fluctuating around an average. There are no data points outside of our limits that we've calculated. Um, we, we could call that a predictable system, or we could say it's nothing but common cause variation. And I remember um, you know, early, you know, early on when I would teach these methods, I was inadvertently creating confusion. So that's why I appreciated hearing <laughs> about your approach of doing some training with the guinea pigs and getting feedback and learning and adjusting. You know, I was inadvertently, I don't think I was saying this, what people were hearing was, well, if there is nothing but noise in the metric and it's not meeting target, then we're not reacting and therefore there's nothing we can do. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That's not what I was trying to teach. Mm -hmm. how, how, what, what sort of language do you use about that situation where we can, uh, you know, the subtitle of, of my book, Measures of Success, says react less but actually then uh, improve more. How, how do you talk through that situation of how people should respond when there's nothing but noise in the metric, but it's not meeting target? Yeah, so we do, um, just to say, we do focus quite heavily on SPC as a tool which can help people understand the likelihood of achieving targets. Because when I learned SPC 20 years ago, in the NHS, we were pretty much solely focused on using SPC as an improvement tool, which, you know, did the improvement that we make result in improvement. And a brilliant tool, of course, SPC is to evidence that. We had a term that was used in England, which was measurement for improvement. And what we found, actually, when we did our early board work was that measurement for improvement was quite an unhelpful term because we had some board members that said, hey, Sam, we know about that SPC stuff. That's what we use when there's an improvement project going on. Mm. We're here as board members. We've got an important job. We're interested in assurance. And actually, what we use for that, the tool for that job is the RAG report. <laughs> so we don't use the term measurement for improvement anymore. We talk about you know data for better decision-making, making data count. And our board training in particular focuses on the... Um, the idea that SPC can help you achieve target. So we would use visual examples in terms of our training and we'd have taught people about SPC and we would have shown them the anatomy of a chart in a very simple way. And we'd never get into the, the real detail and nitty gritty, for instance, of how do you calculate the process limit. We might pick that up at the end of a training session, but we definitely don't want to get distracted at a board level training session on that kind of question. Right. So we will have taught people about um, the anatomy of a chart. They'll have learned about common cause variation and special cause variations. We use those terms. And then we would give them some examples of charts and say, OK, so here's, here's a target to be achieved of 40 or greater. What do you learn from the SPC chart where we're seeing common cause variation here? Um, what do you learn about whether you're going to achieve the target? And of course, dependent on whether the, where the price limits lie, you're either going to be always achieving the target mm -hmm. or never achieving the target. So we take people through real examples like that. And we would try and shy away from, um, I suppose, using technical terms. Also, talking about kind of words like system and process. If we're talking about a particular indicator, we would talk about that particular indicator. Um, I mean, the problem that we sometimes have is well, we've only got common cause variation. There's nothing to be done here. And I think mm -hmm. that's because mm -hmm. historically, some yeah. people have been taught incorrectly that actually I only need to worry mm -hmm. if I've got special cause variation. So we'd focus on things like, you know, if you've got very wide process limits, there's also something, of course, there that you'd want to do. So it's about acting in the right way to the data. We cover as much as we can in 90 minutes. What we're finding now is, you know, sometimes maybe... A couple of years after, people might invite us back in to, to go through, I suppose, a bit more refinement of some of these mm -hmm. things. And maybe they want us to kind of be a bit of a critical friend. Are they really having the right conversation around right. the lovely right. new shiny charts that they've got? 
because of course there's one thing having the chart there's another thing having the right conversation exactly exactly um how, how many charts does a typical board look at regularly wow now there's a question so um so i suppose in terms of the number of measures the number of measures that people are tracking at board level that probably varies from i would say probably about 70 up wow. to potentially several hundred is the wow. reality and that would be performance measures workforce measures um, quality measures and financial measures one of the challenges that we came across to start with is one of the beauties of the RAG report, if there is one at all, is that you can get quite a lot of information on one page. Mm -hmm. So one of our challenges initially was board members said, Sam, we love SPC, but we've got a report that's 200 pages long. If you look at our full board report, we can't possibly have a full chart for every single indicator. Mm. It's just not possible. Mm. And of course, if they did, you'd have a problem that was um, wood for trees. You know, are you going to miss a load of stuff? So that's when we yeah. came up with one of our things that I think was quite inventive, which has unlocked this challenge for us, which has been coming up with summary indicators to summarise the two important things that we're interested in, or the things that we think we're interested in. The first thing we're interested in is what's happening in terms of variation. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? Or is it just common cause stable variation? And then for all of those targets, are we, we going to consistently pass or achieve the target, consistently fail it, or are we going to sometimes hit, hit and miss the target? We've come up with some of the icons which summarise those messages. Um, and we've also come up with a new colour convention to move away from the red and green. And we're using two colours to basically indicate whether there's special cause variation that right. is concerning. Mm -hmm. We're using orange for concern and we're using the colour blue for improvement. And the beauty of those colours is that if you're colourblind, you can see the difference between those two colours and you right. can't see red and green. So we use the icons um, using those colours to identify what's going on in terms of um, variation and performance. And the other thing that we've learned that's really important from our perspective, Mark, is that um, I don't think the SPC chart is sometimes that impactful for different audiences if they've got to remember the rules and count the dots. So all of the um, the tools that we've developed, all, all of the code that we've written to support organisations doing this, all of them have automatic highlighting of special cause variation using those yeah. colours yeah. and applying the icons. And I think that's been a key reason why this has really taken off, because people can remember orange and blue. <laughs> yeah. But blue for improvement. I'm wearing NHS blue today for improvement. <laughs> you know, they don't need to remember the technical stuff. They just need to remember the right. colours and they need to remember how they need to react. Yeah, because you're, you're teaching the boards how to be users of SPC yeah. charts. They're, they're, but, and, and, and that's a different level of detail than learning how to create them. That makes a lot Absolutely. of sense. Absolutely. So what we found is that people are now replacing the RAG summary tables that are horrible and misleading with icon summary tables, which are much more useful. And then people, in terms of how many charts are they now reporting, well, most people are reporting by acceptance. If there's a whole lot of indicators where there's nothing really to say, they're just including the full chart where they've got the highlighted special cause. And we've also recommended a very structured type of commentary to be associated with the charts. So there's some data commentary talking about what's going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. in terms of the data. But the all important stuff really is, OK, so what are the issues here and what are we actually doing about them? And yeah. it's been that shift in terms of, um, I suppose, structure of narrative that's really driven a, a behavior change. Yeah. Well, I think there's this great filtering function with um, SPC. If you have 100 metrics, let's say, and, and there are people, you know, the organizations here in the U.S. that are working with their IS department, um, to help prioritize and, and bring forward, let's say if five of those 100 charts have a signal, those are the five I want to see first. And mm -hmm. not just spend time in a meeting mindlessly, just going through one chart after another. You know, highlight the signals, 
because that is you know a good use of time then to investigate and try to understand and whether it's gotten worse or whether it's gotten better and then maybe a second pass is looking at the metrics that are generally speaking furthest from their targets yes to step back and look at um, the need for improvement what I describe, it's, you know, it's less reactive, but there is still a need. We're, we're not reacting to the last data point. We're reacting to the gap in performance. Yeah, absolutely. And in the NHS, we, we always want boards not only to be focusing on that special cause variation where there's a concern, we also want to be shining a light on the special cause variation that in our instance is blue dots of improvement because actually we want to shine a light on that improvement work that has really, really paid off. So we want it to be those two things. Yes. Because we want to celebrate that, obviously. And we yeah. could learn from it. Yes, yes. And, you know, I think, um, you know, one, one of the scenarios that I teach and you, you probably use something very similar is showing the, the, the trap of the red green. You can have a list of data points that are all green. And people might say, well, there's there's nothing to look at. It's all green. But then when you turn it into an SPC chart, a process behavior chart, one of those green data points might be better than the upper limit, or one of those green data points might be worse than the lower limit. Those are both opportunities for learning, as, as you just pointed out. Absolutely. So that missed opportunity. And what we're finding is um, once people have seen the light, once they're understanding SPC, there's kind of no going back, which is really, really good. So, yeah. um, you know, some people have started to plot some quite unusual things. So I did a board session a couple of years ago, and then I saw on Twitter just a few months ago that the chief information officer had posted an SPC chart, which was number of books that he'd read by month. <laughs> now, it was a bit of an unusual one because this guy has kept a record of the number of books that he's read every month for the past several years. So that's a bit unusual, isn't it? But it's quite <laughs> interesting to see the special cause variation that was um, on the graph. And he could um, he could basically describe what had caused some of that. So getting a new job, well, that resulted in reading less books because he was so, you know, busy with his new job. Yeah. But it's just so, you know, I plot my daily weight. I've got my partner mm, plotting I his daily weight. Why not? Yeah. I, um, yeah, so you think of book as the metric. Like the, the one challenge there is that some books are bigger than others. So he could plot pages read. Oh, that, yeah. would, that, would, that might tell something differently. Because I think we've all heard stories, this comes back to targets of, you know, a, a child, we're trying to encourage them to read, and we set a target if you read this many books, and they pick a bunch of really short books. Well, okay. Yeah. Maybe that's good. <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't oh. driven by anything strange like that. Yeah. I just found it quite funny that he was even plotting something like that for his own interest. Yeah. So you and I are alike in that, um, you know, I haven't always done it. But this year, um, at the beginning of the year, I decided, OK, I need to lose a little bit of weight. I need to get my A1C test uh, performance better. And I've done this in the past, but again, like I, I went back to the daily discipline of putting my weight on an SPC chart. And it is, it's, it, it, there's two things that happen. I wanna hear your thoughts on this. So when you see positive progress in a good direction, the SPC chart can show you clearly my weight is not just fluctuating around an average, it's actually going down. And I could see a couple of shifts downward. But then I also see those periods where Okay, I've stalled out. It is just fluctuating around an average and I've learned not to get too upset about being up a little bit and not too excited about being down a little bit. You have, what, what, what are yeah. your some experiences with this? Me too. So I agree with what you said. Um, I've got one other, um, I suppose, reflection thinking about weight in that um, actually my partner's lost a huge amount of weight and he's been plotting his data on an SPC chart. Mm -hmm. And we kind of had a conversation around targets because mm -hmm. actually what I found from my own personal experience, and he said the same thing, was actually initially for myself, I had a target that just wasn't achievable. And I found, found it, well, it was achievable. I got there eventually, but I found that by setting a target that was too far away, mm. actually it was really demotivating. Mm -hmm. And it kind of made me want to give up. So I stopped weighing myself. You know, I'm never going to get to that target. But actually by setting an interim target and by achieving right. that target, you think, wow, 
have achieved that, that's incredible. Kind of um, spurns you on to do the next phase. So my partner's yeah. lost um, yeah. six stone in weight. Now, if he'd have had a target of losing six stone, I doubt that ever would have happened. Mm -hmm. But by having that kind of interim achievable target, that's been more encouraging. So I agree mm -hmm. with what you said, but I think that for me, the target thing has been quite interesting. Yeah. And there's something yeah. that I can take into my kind of work teaching on that in terms of, you know, set something that's aspirational, but that you can achieve and then raise it again once you've done that. Yeah. And, and it makes me th it makes me think of a couple of things. I think there's um, some important psychology involved of seeing progress and the positive reinforcement that comes from from that. And, and it also makes me think of um, the, the Toyota Kata methodology where you set a challenge, but you to your point, you set an intermediate target and you do some experiments and you see what happens. But, you know, I think this is something I hadn't thought through before. Um, I, I think maybe an intermediate goal would be to reach the lower limit on your weight SPC chart or to, to whatever set of rules you use for determining like, you know, eight consecutive days below your old average weight. Like something there is, you know, I think positive reinforcement. And then at some point you may recalculate your average and limits and maybe that, that new lower limit becomes your next intermediate goal. I don't know, yeah. maybe that would help. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay at the moment. I'm, um, I'm stable and in a good place with my weight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the thing I need to learn and part of my reflection is continuing, like even if it's on a weekly basis, to avoid the situation where the metric creeps, in this case, upward. Yeah. And then you think, oh, <laughs> oh, no, drastic measures are needed. It would be better to avoid the need for drastic measures. And um, I, I'll have to write, I've been meaning, I'll write a blog post about this. But, you know, there is some weight loss people who will say, don't weigh yourself daily because you'll just overreact to the fluctuation. Well, you and I, we can train ourselves to not overreact, but you yeah. could also you could also plot weight on a weekly. I, I have a different SPC chart that's my weight every Wednesday. Okay. And there's less yeah. fluctuation, but it shows the same general trend that's sort of smoothed out in a way. <laughs> Um, and now I'll, I'll, I'll edit this out. One other thing um, before we wrap up here, because I, I know you've shared, you've tweeted. Um, I'll edit this out if this is uncomfortable, but maybe this would just be fun. Can, can you talk about the ham sandwich incident? Oh, the ham sandwich incident. Yeah, <laughs> I will never so, forget this. <laughs> so this, this actually became a good piece of teaching material for a period of time. Right. So, so this was, yeah, so I'd been measuring my daily weight, I was plotting it in my SPC chart. And I think when I started, um, you know, I wasn't happy with my weight, then I got into a good position and I had lovely blue dots of improvements. That was fantastic. We calculated the process limit because it was stable. And then suddenly had a massive special cause variation data point, astronomical point, <laughs> massive astronomical point. And um, so the thing that caused it was quite an interesting thing. It did make it make people laugh in the training. I'd gone and watched my first ever um, match of cricket outdoors. Didn't have loads of um, beer, didn't have loads of wine, but I did have um, a ham baguette, one of those part baked <laughs> baguettes. We get those in England with some ham and, you know, well, that's the only thing that I could um, assign to that special cause variation. So it could have been the bread, of course. Mm -hmm. um, people on Twitter, when I asked the question, you know, what caused this special cause? <laughs> people had, you know, answers like, were you carrying a dog? You know, did you have a suitcase or something? No, it was just eating <laughs> bread and ham. So some people thought that I should redo that experiment, see if it happened again. <laughs> I haven't yet had that opportunity. I'm not sure if I want to, to be honest. It was such an extreme point. <laughs> well, you've learned from that, and that's the key, right? You're right. It could be, it could have been the size of the sandwich. It could have been the baguette. It could have been saltiness of the ham. I mean, there there are many reasons yeah. why our weight may fluctuate in small amounts or from an incident. Like I think of like occasionally, like I've been one of my 
changes is, is trying to eat better. But occasionally my wife and I will have a, we know it's an indulgent meal. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it might not be a ham sandwich, but it's the same effect. It was a different incident. <laughs> yes, and I've also fallen into the trap that you described about um, I stopped weighing myself because maybe I didn't like the direction it was going in. <laughs> and then eventually I key in the data to the SVC chart and it's all gone orange on my graph because, of course, for us, orange is bad. And that's when drastic measures are required. Ignore, that's a great lesson. Ignoring the metric is unlikely to be yes. helpful. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, well, great. Well, so um, maybe uh, there's one last question I want to ask, and I should have asked it earlier, and it's now going to be a little bit out of sequence, but I did want to come back to this. Like you mentioned earlier, 20 years ago, what was that spark, that initial exposure to SPC? Do you remember when and where and why that happened? Yes, I remember it well. So um, actually, this is a this is a common link between us, maybe, of somebody that we both well met or at least um, interacted with. So I'd become a service improvement manager, which was again a role that was um, looking to support the most challenged organisations. We had lots of different training on how we we could support those organisations, and that's when I came across somebody called Mike David. Mm -hmm. And so Mike was the director of analysis at the time for our national improvement body, and he introduced me to SPC chart. So I think you've, you've at least interacted with Mike at some point. Yeah, I think we've crossed paths. He was doing work um, here in the U.S. I know we certainly corresponded um, electronically. Yeah. Yeah. So Mike's, um, Mike's kind of semi-retired now, so he's really pleased that I've kind of taken the baton on yeah. from him. We're still running with the button, you know, he's really pleased at how it's taken off. And I suppose my big focus now is how do I keep this going? And it feels like we've almost got to a tipping point now since um, since lockdown. Clearly, COVID has been awful. But from a kind of work perspective, what it's enabled my small team to do is extend our reach. So rather than doing face to face training, you know, it's expensive. It's difficult to get people in a room. We're now doing everything by a team training that are quite um, short sessions. We've trained about 3,800 people since September in different parts of England. We just mm -hmm. couldn't have done that. So I'm hoping that we've got enough momentum now that it's going to keep going and not be reliant on me. Yeah. Well, that's very, it's, 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 it's so exciting to hear about the progress you've made, Sam, on different levels. Um, it's, you know, cause sometimes this feels like very much an uphill battle of trying to help open people's eyes. I was very fortunate. Um, you know, my, my dad had Don Wheeler's book, Understanding Variation on his okay. shelf. I'm, I, I think I'm remembering correctly where my dad actually got to take a class with Don Wheeler at General Motors. And it, it goes in the category, sometimes people use the, a, a phrase in different contexts of things you can't unsee. Mm-hmm. And to me, SPC is one of those things you, you can't unlearn. And then as I've gone through different organizations, it's I'll, I'll admit it's frustrating when you see the sputtling, the knee jerk reactions. I'm like, there's a, there's a better way and trying to invite people to the table to have that conversation. It happens sometimes, but it's just it's really encouraging and energizing to hear about the progress that you've made there, you and the others that you're working with. Yeah, we're guessing there for sure. You have your intermediate targets as you're working toward that challenge of everybody thinking and operating this way, right? Yeah, so aiming for the whole of the NHS, that is what I'm aiming for. I'd like to get around to every trust. So we did a little um, review process recently to look at, you know, what do the performance reports look like for all of the trusts in England? And when we looked, this was just before Christmas, there were about 70 trusts that were still relying on VAG reporting and those two-point comparison arrows. So we're going to be targeting those um, to see if we can move those away as well. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody will check out all of the, the resources that, that you and the NHS have made available. I'll put all sorts of links in the show notes to the Making Data Count website, which includes the free interactive ebook. And I'll link to that journal article 
uh, from BMJ Leader. There, there's so much out there, and I, and I would hope, you know, to my listeners, and I should have said this up front, this is not about healthcare management. This is about management. And I would encourage anyone who's made it this far in the episode, um, no matter what industry you're in, the, the, the making data count resources would be incredibly relevant and useful. You may just have to mentally say, well, instead of this type of metric, let's imagine it's this type of metric. The same, yeah. the same lessons apply, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and we're very happy for anybody to use what we've developed. So yeah, plot those dots. Hashtag plot the dots. <laughs> Keep looking for it. And uh, the, the materials are amazing. I think if I remember right, our books came out at right about the same time. And uh, if, if, if your book had come out first, I, I'm, I might not have written anything. I might have just pointed everybody. Like I've pointed people <laughs> to Don Wheeler's book. I also point people um, to the Making Data Count resources because it's it's amazing. It's really well done, and I, I can see why it's been um, so effective for you, Sam. Thank you. It's really, Appreciate it. Yeah, and and I'm so excited that you know that we could, um, if you will, I don't know what the Britishism would be. You know, we're, we're, we we get to geek out on this. How would you say that in England? Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe nerd out, geek out, yeah. Quite nerd different. out, okay. Yeah. Well, this has been fun, nerding out with uh, with Mark and Sam. Um, <laughs> but our, our guest, again, has been Samantha Riley. She's the Deputy Director of Intensive Support for NHS England and Improvement. This, this has been a lot of fun, and um, thank you. Thank you again for doing this. Many thanks. Thank you.